everybody. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Redeeming Truth. I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here at Redeemer Bible Church in Gilbert, Arizona. And with me today is Kathy Herod. She is the president of the Center for Arizona Policy. And the reason I'm having her on today is because if you live in Arizona, you have a very important task at this election when it comes to a specific ballot measure, Prop 207. It's very important for you to understand what would happen if Prop 207 was passed. And it's very important because you are a Christian and this directly is impacted the Christian worldview and the Bible directly impacts how you should vote on this issue. So this is this is beyond partisan politics. This is I think this is beyond all of that. This is okay. You and me. I'm a pastor. You're a Christian. How should we think through Prop 207? And so Kathy, thank you for being here. Like I said, president of Center for Arizona Policy. You focus on life. You focus on marriage. You focus on religious and educational freedom with your um, with your group. And so, um, help us think through what is called the um, Prop 207, the Smart and Safe Arizona Act. In general, what is that about? Well, it's nothing. It's anything but smart and safe. Prop 207 was legalized recreational marijuana in our state, so it would dramatically change the character of our state. Right now we have medical marijuana being legal. This would extend it to recreational marijuana for those supposedly that are 21 and over, but we know that um, it would be accessible for children under 21. So, um, so let me get, so I'm, I'm trying to put myself into the shoes of a person living here in Gilbert because uh, I, I live in Queen Creek. I live right next door and I'm just trying to think through this logically. Um, and I've, I've gone through the 17 pages. I've read a lot of it. It is very hard to read. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, it's up there. Just go ahead and read it. It is tedious to read. It is not formatted in a way that makes reading it accessible. And so you are an expert in these areas. And so that's why I'm having you on to say, help us think through this so the first thing, you brought it up. So this, does this impact medical marijuana at all? No, and we need to emphasize that over and over again. Medical marijuana will not be restricted. Um, if defeating Prop 207, voting no on 207, will not stop anyone who qualifies for a medical marijuana card from getting it. It will not impact or roll back medical marijuana in any way. Um, passage of Prop 207 simply creates a law that allows anyone to basically grow, produce, possess marijuana for recreational use. So it does not touch the medical use at all. So all this is really about is legalizing recreational marijuana, right? This isn't about creating yes. a new industry, is it? Well, it's in, um, yes and no, I guess I would say. It's, um, it's enabling the medical marijuana industry to have first dibs on recreational marijuana and enables them to make more money. And so that's why we call it big marijuana. So it expands the marijuana industry considerably. And so you'll have the pot shops will be for recreational use as well as medical use. So a new industry, um, you know, in some ways, yes, because it, it's a new recreational marijuana industry that will be all over Arizona. So this, is this just about legalizing the use of rec marijuana for recreation or is it more than that? It's more than that. And when you say 17 pages, if it was just as simple as legalizing recreational marijuana, you know, they could have done that in a page or two. But no, it has a significant restrictions in it. It's about far more than just allowing someone that wants to grow pot in their backyard or wants to walk in and get a joint or whatever or a gummy bear. You know, it, it's about far more than just simply allowing someone to grow, produce, use, possess marijuana for recreational purposes. So the part of the appeal of this law is the appeals to our base desire for money. And so there is this, hey, schools are going to get money. Government's going to get funded. Is that true? No, it's not. And you're going to, it's, for one thing, any of the funds that would go to education, it's only the community colleges. So for those who are concerned about funding for K through 12 education in our state, don't be fooled. Um, the the funds from, rec from the sale, the taxation of recreational marijuana will not help K through 12 funding for district and charter schools. And so don't be confused about that. It does not, it's limited in what it funds. So for, um, for this bill, 17 pages, it's actually 17 pages that are, are explaining how this is actually going to reduce the size of government here in our state of, of Arizona, right? 
No, it's going to increase the size of government because it creates a whole new, you have a whole new bureaucracy that's overseeing, creating the tax, um, the licenses, all of that. So it's not going to limit government in any way. And what I saw in the, um, in the funding portion is that community colleges get funding after a, a whole bunch of other things mm -hmm. get funded. Can you kind of talk about that? Yes, I'm trying to find the list. I don't have the list in front of me, but what these measures do, that's why the fine print is so important. It'll have a list of who's going to get funding. And yeah, and as you said, community colleges is not up there. And so that, that's where, um, you know, plus there's a, a big question how much money really is going to go, um, you know, from the taxes. And in other states, the promises of all this revenue from having recreational marijuana legalized, that simply has not been proven true in other states. Because the cost for all of the effects on the culture go skyrockets, right? Yeah. So the example of in Colorado, um, in Colorado, the state of Colorado pays four dollars and fifty cents in marijuana-related expenses for every dollar in revenue. So that's significant. So so what if revenue is coming in in Colorado? It's costing four fifty to a dollar for every dollar of revenue. So that's um, that's important to know that, and that means. It's a negative impact on our economy and on government funding, not positive. And you could even make the charge that it's going to hurt public funding of public schools because it's going to reduce what's available in the general fund. So police are pretty overworked. And uh, so a, a law like this is actually going to allow them to focus on other crimes so they can stop dealing with little petty crimes like if someone has a joint, right? No, um, and that's not what we see in the other states because, you know, to just stop and think about road safety. Um, we know that the Prop 207 will put you in more danger on the road. You'll have more impaired drivers. Um, you'll have more, um, it, there's not a bright line standard on how you test someone on whether they're high on marijuana. So it's going to be an increase in, in what, what's going to be expected of our law enforcement. And one interesting note is one of the state trooper associations has come out against Prop 207. So it's not like this is backed by law enforcement on the grounds that, oh, this is going to help us. Law enforcement does not support a yes vote on 207. But at the same time, it's easy for cops to, um, to test for a blood alcohol limit. And so is there an easy <laughs> test for people to, for cops to um, test for a marijuana limit in, a blood, in the blood? No, there's not, there's not a roadside test where they pull someone over who's clearly been an impaired driver or they've had, caused an accident. And the blood tests on alcohol may show that they're not alcohol. There's not a roadside test for marijuana. And there's also not a reliable test that you know, tells you um, what impairment is. I'm just trying to make sure I get this right from my notes. So there's not like a bright line standard that says, you know, like how with alcohol, we know if it's 0.08, then you're driving under the influence. There's not the equivalent with marijuana where you can say, the number, I think it's metabolites in the blood or whatever. There's not that we can say, okay, this means you're impaired because of the amount of marijuana that you have in your system. There's nothing equivalent. So law enforcement basically has their hands tied when they pull over somebody that could be impaired by marijuana use. So um, going, to the, going to our prisons now, um, is it true that there are just a, an inordinate amount of people, there are just a lot of people in our jails who are, are in jail because of marijuana possession? No, and that's one of the biggest fallacies out there, I believe, that most often when someone is charged with marijuana possession, they have other, uh, and they're in prison, they're also charged with other crimes. So they're not in prison solely because of marijuana possession or use, or it'd have to be a pretty high amount of marijuana possession or selling marijuana, but most often it is with, um, paired with other crimes. And then also, it, if it's just marijuana possession, they're going to reduce it already and the Maricopa County attorney has even recently announced that she was going to, to do that. And so that some, someone who gets picked up and they've got a joint or they've got marijuana in their possession, it's going to, especially as first offense, it's going to be reduced. But no, do not believe the fallacy that, that people are in prison solely because of marijuana use. That's just not true. But um, in states where um, this bill, a, a similar bill was passed, drug-related crimes went down, right? No, they did not go down and um, they went up and we see that in Colorado. Some of the states we don't have the information in yet, but um, there's no, there's no question that there's an increase of crime. There's an increase of employers with problems on the workforce. 
that this does not solve anything. But at the same time, uh, it would, it would um, make the illegal black market on marijuana disappear, wouldn't it? No, because in my understanding from what's happened in Colorado, why pay the tax when you can still thrive on the black market? It's, it's really a, a logical that why would you pay the tax that comes with sale of, sale of recreational marijuana? The black market still thrives in Colorado. And so the black market will still thrive in Arizona. Um, legalization of recreational marijuana will not stop the black market. But there's not a big, um, there's not a very big black market in illegal drugs here in Arizona, is there? <laughs> um, don't we wish that there was not a big market in illegal drugs? But I think we only have to look at, um, you know, the stories that we know of, of certainly families that would be listening to this that have had loved ones um, with many that um, do start with marijuana and then go on to harder drugs. And so, yes, we have an epidemic of drug use in this state. And, um, and this is just going to make it worse. Yeah, I remember talking to Bill Montgomery, the former Arizona County attorney, and he told me that, no, actually, we have one of the largest black markets in all of the country for illegal drugs. And so this is, this is not helpful so far. Um, so what happens if a person, uh, so let's go to employee law, employer law. So this law is very clear that an employer um, can create laws and rules uh, for their work um, environment that prohibits use of marijuana while at work. But what happens if somebody shows up high to their job? Well, Prop 207 creates a personal right to use marijuana, and it weakens the rights of employers to maintain a drug-free workplace. So what happens is, is that employers cannot, under 207, employers cannot prohibit marijuana use by their employees. So outside the workplace, and they cannot take adverse action against an employee simply because of a positive test for marijuana. So we know certainly a lot of employers now would require a drug test before they hire someone. So what this means is you could be having an edible or smoking a joint before you go to work. You go to work and you're high and your employer can do nothing about it. So when you stop and think about that, you think about um, a daycare worker or a healthcare worker that's taking care of children or vulnerable adults in say a, an assisted living situation and they go in and they're high on marijuana and, and the employer can do nothing, uh, adverse action, which would include terminating the employee um, they're protected under this um, and able to use pot outside the workplace. So, um, and that's, you know, even the states that with legal states, their data again shows that this becomes increasingly difficult for business owners to identify and develop a safe and sober workplace. And again, you know, you know, if somebody comes in and they're drunk from alcohol, it's pretty easy to test for it, but not for marijuana. So if somebody were to be high and show up at their job and the owner or the manager fires that person for being high, not being able to do their job even because they're high, could, what, what could happen to that owner or manager? Well, I believe the owner or manager is opening themselves up for a, a lawsuit. Um, certainly um, when it says no adverse action, to me that means it's no adverse action on letting the, employer, the employee go. So it may be a little bit of a gray area as far as how judges would rule on that, but it will be much more difficult for employers to have that drug-free workplace. We do not see that being really a possibility for employers. So what about if you're, you're living in a neighborhood here in Gilbert or East Valley, wherever, and um, you're, you notice that your neighbor is growing pot in, your back, in their backyard, they're selling it from their home, um, they're, 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 they've got all this stuff in their house to produce it, um, what can be done about that? Well, nothing. Um, it allows um, anyone to use, I'm going to make sure I get this right, it allows homegrown and home production labs. So one adult household could have up to six plants, two adult households could have up to 12 plants. And you, you as a neighbor could not do anything about it, neither could, if you're in an HOA, neither could an HOA be able to ban or regulate homegrown marijuana in neighborhoods. So anyone's neighbor could be growing the marijuana. It doesn't matter whether you're in a neighborhood with a bunch of children or anything or close to a school or close to a church, that um, marijuana will be readily available in people's backyards. And what, will the HOA have any power to uh, regulate that? No, it does not allow the HOA to regulate it or ban it in any way. 
So um, pot delivery, like pizza delivery, this doesn't say any, this law doesn't say anything about that, does it? Oh, yes, it does. Um, it allows home delivery of marijuana. So your next door neighbor could have, I guess, Amazon or UPS or whoever, or the marijuana um, seller deliver marijuana on your front doorstep. Okay. And, and that's, that's a big change. When, when, people, when you hear that, oh, this is better than the 2016 measure that Arizona voters said no to, that they've made improvements. Well, they haven't made improvements, and one change is allowing home delivery. And that's something that, that we just need to make sure everybody understands. Do you want marijuana being delivered to your next door neighbor? So when it comes to city council, for instance, let's say there's a group of people that get very fired up about some issue and they, they all win and they're now part of their city council and they want to they wanna get rid of mer medical marijuana dispensaries or recreational marijuana dispensaries. They just want to get rid of it from their city. Are they able to do that? No. And so if you're, say, where the city of Phoenix or Gilbert or where they've, they've allowed medical dispensaries to be set up in their community, if there's a medical dispensary in your city, you cannot, they cannot say no to a recreational marijuana dispensary. And the licenses, this is where it creates a monopoly, the um, licensees, uh, it's the medical dispensaries that have first dibs on getting a recreational marijuana shop. So, the, um, so your city, like if, if Gilbert has a medical marijuana dispensary, Mesa, Tempe, then they have to allow the recreational marijuana dispensary and they cannot make more restrictive rules. So say there's already a recreational, like we're down from our office, there's probably within a mile, there's a, recre there's, there's a medical, medical, medical marijuana dispensary. So if they add recreational marijuana, well, the city of Phoenix can't say, oh, we're going to have different rules for you for recreational marijuana. It can't be more restrictive. So it'll be very available. So how about marketing? There's a, there's a section in here about marketing, and it talks about not marketing to children. In, but but how, how does this make it so that's impossible to do? Well, it says that adver advertising must come from the marijuana establishment, but it says it only restrains advertising to youth or teens when the advertising is, quote, direct individualized communication or dialogue. So I guess that means a text message or something, you know, some kind of a direct message or maybe Facebook or something but there's no way that the advertising, I mean, just think about when we drive through and we see the medical marijuana billboards. You know, we see, certainly see billboards all over the place about medical marijuana. There's nothing that restricts them from also doing that and that's gonna reach um, children. But there's target marketing on social media like yeah, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, those kinds of Twitter. Yeah, and I don't know that that, I don't think that direct individualized communication or dialogue you know, it's going to be too easy for them to say, oh, well, we're just on Facebook or we're just on Twitter. We're not just targeting teens. We're targeting adults. But tweens, teens are going to see that. There's no question. But, I mean, Kathy, this kind of marijuana, it's just the same as the <laughs> stuff in the 60s, right? Like, there's, there's really no difference. A lot of people watching probably had their teenage days where they did some of that stuff. And so, you know, it, it's just the same, right? No. Yeah. Um, and so just for example, a marijuana joint in the 70s had about 2% THC. And THC, of course, is the ingredient that gets you high. Today, it's 20 to 25% THC. And so it's, look at that 20 to 25% THC. And then the levels in candies or oils or vape products that they market to kids, um, it's much higher. And that can be up to nearly 100%. So this is... Um, it's just, you know, we say it's not the pot that people smoked at Woodstock. It's um, far higher, far more dangerous. So let's say that this passes and the experiment we find is just really bad. Let's say we, hey, it's just like, like all of the things that we've talked about, let's say all of that is ignored, this passes, um, but then we start to see the costs in our hospitals, the costs on our roads, the costs to our children, all of those things. And we start to see, okay, this is really bad for us and we, we need to fix it. Is there anything the governor can do, the state legislature can do if Prop 207 passes? Um, it will be very, very difficult to change any of the provisions in Prop 207. Arizona has something called the Voter Protected Act. And what that means is that if, the, if Arizona um, passes Prop 207, it means that no changes can be made by the state legislature unless there's a 75% vote. So a three-quarters vote of all the members in the legislature, which 
certainly would be a rarity on an issue like this. But in addition to that, it has to be a, a change in the law that would further the purpose of the law. So, it, and then of course it becomes a court case. So that, you know, when you think the original intent of the initiative to legalize recreational marijuana, to allow people to grow pot, all these provisions that it has, anything the legislature or the governor would have to do, three-fourths vote plus further that original intent. So to try to restrict it or make changes would be virtually impossible. The other avenue would have to go back to the ballot and change it at the ballot box by a vote of the people. And we know that that is expensive and it's difficult to do. So uh, just a couple more questions. So when it comes to the funding for and against this bill, uh, um, the funding is pretty equal, right? I mean, both sides have about the same amount of money that's for and against this. Um, don't I wish. Um, the marijuana, the pro side, the yes side on Prop 207 uh, is funded primarily by the medical marijuana dispensaries. Um, we like to call it big marijuana and they have millions. They've already spent millions to get signatures, to get it on the ballot. And they are sitting, I believe, like on two or three million already for the campaign. And I will tell you that the no on 207 campaign is sitting on um, maybe $20,000. I mean, that, that's kind of where we're at right now. And so that, you know, we don't have to match them for money, um, but we need, but we hope at least obviously to have enough money. We need enough money to wage a viable campaign. And we think we can get there. We hope and pray we can. But this is where the grassroots is so important. This is where it's so important for um, moms and dads and for citizens who see the damage and the danger in this to speak out, to spread the word that the no vote on 207, you know, I often say that what people say, well, oh, it's going to be, marijuana is going to be legalized at some point for recreational use. It's going to happen. So what? I don't really care about it. Well, it's only inevitable if we roll over and I say play dead and don't do anything. But if we spread the word, we spread the dangers, people understand and unpack what's really in those 17 pages, we can vote no and we can defeat this. So if people want to know more about the effect that marijuana has on a state or a community, is there, are, are there any movies that, or documentaries you'd recommend? Yes, there's one that, oh, I've got to pull up the right name of it, Chronic State. There's one called Chronic State, but I would recommend, um, key things I would recommend is going to um, no prop, no 207az.com. That's no 207az.com. Sign up for the email. See the information that's on there. The research data is on there, or it's being put on there as, as we speak. And so check it out. Um, get the simple bullet points. You know, decide what you think is the most persuasive. We know that when we tell people that it's harmful to kids and that it's going to create danger on the roads, that those are the two most persuasive points in many ways for people to think, oh, wait a minute, maybe this isn't the right way to do it. But, um, but that's what, um, but Chronic State is the video, but also sign up for the no, no, let me get it right. We just set up a new website, no207az.com and get the emails. They're weekly emails. If you're on Twitter, um, if you're on Facebook, um, like, the, like it on, on um, Facebook, follow on Twitter, because that's where um, up-to-date information will always be available. So as, you, as, as we come to a close here, what, what would you encourage the Christian church to do concerning this? Um, to pray, um, to, you know, to certainly to pray, to speak out, to sign up for the emails, to, um, to not buy the lie that it's inevitable. Um, I would also emphasize that this is an issue. So just like you as a pastor is doing this podcast, pastors from the pulpit um, the church can, can speak out and encourage the no vote. This is not the same as a candidate campaign. This is not the same as the U.S. Senate race. So the, um, the legal requirements for churches and for pastors, you can speak out and say, I encourage a no vote and here's why. So I, we need to spread the word. So it's pray, sign up um, for the emails at the no prop AZ, no, no, I got it wrong again, no 207az.com, um, sign up on social media, um, and then, um, you know, spread the word to your friends and we'll have, there'll, there'll be a lot more going on. We'll probably be having some events. We'll be having some town halls, those types of things. So all of that key into the website and um, join the grassroots army in a sense that's going to be statewide to really say no, not in our state. We, we don't want recreational marijuana legalized in Arizona. Well, Kathy, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. And if you're well, watching you. right now and you, um, 
you got a little fired up about this and you want to do something, one of the easiest things you can do right now is share this video. When you go to know207az.com, uh, there are graphics there that you can download and you can post them on social media. You can start the conversations now on social media with your friends who live here in Arizona. It is critical, like Kathy said, this is why the election turned four years ago, two weeks before the uh, election last year. That Proposition 205 was winning. And within that two-week span, the grassroots completely overturned Prop 205. And so we can do this again in Prop 207. Now, why would a pastor do something like this? I said at the beginning, and I'll say it at the end, this is about loving our neighbors. This will destroy much of what we love about our state. That's not fear mongering. Watch the, the documentary Chronic State. You can see what it's already done in places like Seattle. You can see in that, in that documentary about what it's done in Colorado. It has severely impacted the, the livelihood, the, the life that people get to live in those places. And so the question is, do you love your neighbors? Do you love your kids, your grandkids? Enough to simply vote no on Prop 207 and encourage your friends to do the same. That's my hope. And so this is something, like Kathy said, the church Christians should be involved and should care deeply about simply because we love our neighbors. And so again, Kathy, thank you so much for being here. It's very helpful to get, we want to make sure we get the facts right. And so I think you've really helped us do that. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate your leadership and, and your engagement on this issue and so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. And thanks for watching Redeeming Truth. See you next time.